I'm Alex Raygrant, staff neurologist at the Mellon Center for Multiple Sclerosis at the Cleveland Clinic. Welcome to our Multiple Sclerosis Virtual Grand Round Series. In this session, we will review the newest treatment options for multiple sclerosis with Dr. Alistair Coles. Dr. Coles is a well-known neuroimmunologist, consulting neurologist, and ordained minister who teaches at Cambridge, works at Addenbrooke's and Peterborough Hospitals in England. He has won multiple awards for his teaching and scholarship and has published extensively on neuroimmunology and therapeutics in multiple sclerosis. He will review where we stand with the new cornucopia of medications for MS and strategies one might employ to utilize these medicines and optimize outcomes in our MS patients. He will compare escalating versus induction strategies in MS care and map the progression of MS therapeutics from the late 1990s to the present day. So thank you for asking me to talk about the Potential and latest treatment options for multiple sclerosis. This is Alistair Coles calling from Cambridge, UK. Uh, before we get started, let me just uh, run through my disclosures. The important one here is that uh, I am closely linked with the development of one drug that I will be mentioning, uh, which is Alentuzumab, manufactured by Genzyme, a Sanofi company. And I'll say straight away that Alentuzumab is not a licensed drug in the United States, but is licensed in other regions of the world. Which um, brings me on to uh, my next slide, which just uh, reiterates this important point that not all of the therapies that I'll be mentioning in this presentation are licensed, uh, and not all of them are licensed in all regions of the world. So as you think about the implications for your practice, just please take into account your local regulatory environment. And it's helpful, too, uh, that uh, Ed Fox has done a very nice talk in this series about risk mitigation for uh, current therapies, and he goes through all of the potential side effects of newer drugs in that account. So I won't be doing that. Uh, today I'm going to be focusing on more strategic issues in how we handle uh, new and potential MS therapies. As we look at the goals for treating people who have multiple sclerosis. There are a variety of them, uh, and I've listed them here. We will naturally be focusing on the goal of reducing the frequency of relapses, uh, and that is where most of our attention uh, is placed nowadays when we see a patient. But just before we look at that, I just wanted to remind you that there are trials of completely different strategies in the treatment of MS that are going on currently. So for instance, trials of channel blockers uh, as the acute treatment of, of individual episodes of MS, uh, trials of neuroprotective and remyelinating therapies. And I mention this not because I imagine any of these drugs will become available very quickly, but just so that uh, we don't forget that in the future it is quite likely that we're going to be using combination therapies of drugs and treatments that have very different goals uh, in, the, um, uh, in, in interfering and uh, reversing the pathogenesis of multiple sclerosis in all its various manifestations. That having been said, though, today uh, for the rest of this presentation, I will be focusing on drugs which have as their goal the reduction of inflammation in the brain, which um, has the immediate effect of reducing the frequency of attacks and thereby in reducing the accumulation of disability that is acquired as a consequence of relapses. Before we look at the specifics of each individual drug, it is worth considering the uh, various strategies for starting and switching drugs, the most common of which is the escalation therapy approach, which I've illustrated here, where essentially you take all patients with a disease, here multiple sclerosis, and those that are active you expose to a mildly effective drug, which is likely to have mild uh, toxicity. And for some people, that will be sufficient. Their disease will be suppressed. But for others, the disease will break through. So in the case of multiple sclerosis, that's probably 
manifested by new lesions on scans or by uh, relapses, in which case uh, we would put such people on a slightly more efficacious drug which is likely to be more toxic and that will be effective for a proportion of those patients, leaving a residue of patients whose disease breaks through even this treatment. And so they're demonstrating they have quite aggressive disease. And so for them, we would uh, prescribe a treatment which we think is most efficacious uh, and this almost certainly will have significant side effects. This is the approach that uh, most neurologists take in the treatment of multiple sclerosis, and, and it has the big advantage that we are only exposing people to the potentially serious side effects of powerful drugs when their disease has been proven to be aggressive. The disadvantage of this approach, and I'm not sure that this is um, widely recognized or considered, is that it does take time to escalate through these therapies. So for those people who have the most aggressive MS, who ultimately will be on uh, the most efficacious therapies, they will have spent some time failing therapies. And in the context of multiple sclerosis, what that means is that they have had disease activity, they will have accumulated disability, and potentially, um, potentially they will have increased their risk of progression to secondary progressive multiple sclerosis. And that I see as a significant disadvantage to this escalation therapy approach. So there is an alternative, um, and that is called the induction therapy approach. Uh, and this is less widely used uh, by neurologists when treating MS. But the way this works is that all patients with active disease would be exposed to the most efficacious treatment. And the likelihood here is that most of those patients would have suppression of their disease. A smaller number of patients uh, would still demonstrate some disease activity. And they could either receive further doses of this highly effective treatment, or potentially, um, and this is speculative, but has been shown on a few occasions, potentially a milder drug, a drug that may not have been effective as a first-line therapy, might now become effective because some disease suppression has already been achieved by the initial therapy. Now, a very strong advantage of this approach is that you're treating multiple sclerosis as early and as hard as possible. And it's clear uh, to me, and I think this is becoming the consensus, that the best way of reducing the net accumulation of disability in people with MS is to treat aggressively early on in the course of the disease. The clear disadvantage of this approach is that people whose disease may have been suppressed by mild drugs, less toxic drugs, are unnecessarily exposed to the potentially very serious risks of more powerful agents. Now, I presented these as uh, two alternative strategies, the escalation uh, therapy strategy or the induction therapy strategy. In reality, uh, most practicing neurologists will probably treat most patients following an escalation approach, but when they have a sense that an individual patient has a poor prognosis by virtue or features in their early disease history, they may well take an induction therapy approach. Um, so the reality is a, a bit more nuanced than I presented. But I think it is uh, important to be overt about the way we use these drugs. Um, and I'll be honest and say that I am a proponent of the induction therapy approach. Uh, I think a high-risk, high-gain strategy in the treatment of multiple sclerosis uh, is undervalued and not used sufficiently uh, for the benefit of patients. That's my bias here. Okay, well, that having been said, 
uh, let's now look at the different agents that are being used and may potentially be used very soon to reduce inflammation in the brains of our patients with multiple sclerosis to reduce relapses and the consequent accumulation of disability. And I'm going to use a uh, fairly standard way of depicting this in this pseudo graph here, uh, which I've modified from Steve Hauser's article, which I've cited there, although I have made uh, several uh, changes to Steve Hauser's treatment, so I take full responsibility for this, where I have depicted a drug um, as taking a position on an axis where going north or going up, there is increasing efficacy of the drug. And going east or going to the right is an increasing burden of treatment. And I use that phrase because I'm trying to combine here the domains of safety and the domains of difficulty of administration. So a drug may lie to the right or to the east on this chart because it has a worse safety profile than a drug to its left or because the mode of administration makes it less easy for patients. So this is not um, a scientifically composed picture. It is subjective, and people will have different opinions about the exact positions of different drugs. But nonetheless, I think this is a useful way of beginning to place drugs relative one to another. So here is my starting position. This is where we were a few years ago, uh, where we essentially had the choice with our patients between some very safe injectable drugs with modest efficacy, clotirima and the interferon beta drugs, and some really quite dangerous treatments uh, with certain efficacy but very real risks, that is mitoxantrone and autologous hematopoietic stem cell transplantation. Those were uh, the choices we had, um, which in the treatment of the vast majority of people with multiple sclerosis essentially was not a choice. It just isn't appropriate for the majority of patients with MS to expose them to mitoxantrone or stem cell transplantation. So for several years we were lulled, in my opinion, into a quite a passive position where we were not forced to face up to the risks of treatment and we were not forced to face up to the risks of leaving multiple sclerosis untreated or partially treated because the only treatment options essentially were glitterima or beta interferon. If we move on to a table now, a graph now, which depicts all of the treatments which are licensed in one region of the world uh, or another, but not necessarily in, in your region, uh, we begin to see a spread of drugs that occupy uh, the important middle ground between the partially effective safe and the dangerous treatments. And if I go on a bit further, I've now put in a list of drugs which I think uh, will be emerging in the next uh, two years or so and may well become uh, licensed or available in other ways uh, in some regions of the world. And you can see that this picture really is getting pretty complicated. This will only become more and more complicated. So we are going to have to work out a way of clarifying or categorizing treatments uh, to make it easier to uh, place a new drug as it emerges into the market and to communicate the uh, various classes of drug to our patients in a useful way. So one way <clears throat> that I think is quite useful is to, dis to divide uh, treatments into high uh, and low risk and uh, that I've shown here. So I talk to patients about uh, low risk and uh, low gain treatments, and here they're in green, and the frankly dangerous treatments, and here they're in dark red. Um, 
and then a middle zone of medium risk, medium gain therapies. So the high-risk, high-gain, dangerous treatments are those that have a mortality of less than one percent, uh, 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 of more than one percent. Uh, so those patients who are seropositive for JC virus, taking that telusumab after two years, uh, patients on mitoxantrone, or having the highly effective but most dangerous therapy of all, autologous stem cell transplantation. Now, these treatments I would reserve to very, very few individuals in ordinary clinical practice. It would seem to me there has to be a very special region by virtue of high aggressive disease and no other alternative therapies for these to be reasonable treatment options. So the regular decision would lie between taking uh, what I call a low-risk, low-gain therapy or a medium-risk, medium-gain therapy, and I've depicted those there. Already you can see I've made some quite subjective judgments, and you may well um, want to challenge those, uh, but at least we're beginning to categorize these treatments. Another way of um, dicing these up is just to ask whether these are all therapies or whether they're parenteral. Uh, and for physicians, I'm not sure that we are necessarily too bothered by this distinction. Uh, I think for us, the efficacy of a therapy and the complexity um, and severity of its safety profile are more important. But for people with multiple sclerosis, this is a very real issue, which we uh, should not underestimate, particularly those people who have been used to the injectables, the, the modestly effective injectables, uh, who really have a significant burden on their lifestyle um, when traveling or when working away from home, um, when trying to do sport and so on, by the need to store and to use these injectable therapies. And for them, an oral therapy really is very attractive. Um, in general, as you can see, the um, low-risk, low-gain therapies here are oral, and the high-risk or the medium-risk, medium-gain therapies are parental. But there are some standouts there. So glutirima and interferon beta are problematic now in this landscape as offering no definite efficacy advantage over other therapies but being parenteral. And I think it is right that uh, patients look to the oral therapies uh, as they become available in their region um, to replace those injectables. And dimethyl fumarate is a standout drug here as being very safe and yet having a significant efficacy, possibly greater than uh, glutirima or interferon beta. And I think it's reasonable to look to that drug if available um, in the region where you work uh, as a good choice for someone for whom safety is an important consideration. The other standout is fingolimod, which uh, offers clear efficacy advantages over the uh, low-risk, low-gain therapies. Um, and is attractive um, at first glance to many patients because of this promise of high efficacy, and yet it is oral. Um, but increasingly, we are becoming aware of the complexity of the safety profile of this drug. And I think it's important, or I have come to speak to patients about this drug in a way that emphasizes that not all oral therapies are simple and not all oral therapies come uh, problem-free, as I think some patients might imagine. So just a note of caution there as we describe the place of fingolimod. Finally, <clears throat> in trying to dice these up, uh, you might, uh, as someone who follows the escalation therapy approach, want to describe these drugs as first, second, or third line, and uh, that's the approach that Steve Hauser has taken in the uh, article cited at the beginning of this uh, presentation. 
and uh, I've made some alterations to his categorization. So this is mine and mine only, but it it stands as you see, uh, pretty much matching the categorization of low risk, low gain, medium risk, medium gain, and high risk, high gain, frankly dangerous drugs. But in the same time that we look at this, it's important uh, to remember that some of the drugs that are described here as second-line therapy, uh, natalizumab, alemtuzumab, rituximab, fingolimod, and dicluzumab, have been used uh, in treatment-naive patients uh, first-line in trials. Uh, so a case can be made, at least on the basis of those trials, uh, for their use first line in an induction therapy approach. Uh, and this would be particularly reasonable when considering those patients who have subtypes of multiple sclerosis, uh, which are now called the rapidly evolving severe MS or the highly active relapsing remitting MS despite interferon uh, subtypes. Uh, these are uh, beloved of the regulators, although I don't honestly use these phrases in my regular practice, nor have I seen a colleague do so. But we recognize that patients with um, aggressive multiple sclerosis uh, might benefit from earlier treatment with these drugs, which, as depicted in this graph, are called second line. All I'm doing there really is uh, repeating the point that induction therapy approach with more potent agents might be reasonable uh, in the context of an individual patient with an ag aggressive multiple sclerosis. So I want to summarize where we've got to here by making these simple points that uh, we are seeing increasing numbers of therapies emerging for the treatment of uh, multiple sclerosis. And I think uh, in a few years' time, we will have a, a complex landscape. And that it is the job of the physician to uh, be able to assess the uh, efficacy and treatment burden associated with these drugs and to place them in some sort of a landscape, some sort of a categorization to allow patients to make appropriate choices based on uh, the physician's and the patient's assessment of their disease severity. And I would encourage you to be overt in considering the strategy you are using to suppress the disease in your patients, uh, simplistically divided into either an induction or an escalation therapy approach. So I'd like now to um, consider some of these points in the context of specific uh, cases. And with each of these cases, I will offer you the same um, six choices of therapies. It'll be the same list each time. Uh, and the question will be, uh, in each case, which therapy would you now use? Um, there will certainly be times when uh, it, the choice might be between one, two, or even three therapies. So this isn't going to be uh, a straightforward one. So the first case is of a 32-year-old woman who has had her third episode of relapsing remitting MS over two years. She's received no previous therapy. And uh, it's important to her that she wants to start a family soon. Uh, she hates needles. She's frightened of drug side effects generally. So which of these therapies would you use? So uh, I think there are a variety of possible responses, but my preferred option, if it's available in the region where you work, would be dimethyl fumarate. So my reason for saying this is we're clearly do dealing with someone who's very safety conscious. Um, they're needle phobic, so the uh, uh, um, interferon beta and glutirima option is not suitable. Um, but in dimethyl fumarate, we have a drug that I imagine, I think, is more effective than the other low-risk orals. Now, the patient that uh, we're talking about here is concerned to start a family uh, and to become pregnant, and there is no uh, multiple sclerosis 
disease-modifying therapy where we can say with complete confidence it is safe to try to start a family whilst on therapy. So that will remain an issue for this patient and uh, the physician will have to come to a, uh, an understanding about how they're going to approach that. If we move on to our next case, 24-year-old man who's had his third episode of relapsing or remitting multiple sclerosis in two years, but this time all of those experienced whilst on natalizumab therapy, having previously had four years of treatment with interferon beta 1A. And a recent MRI scan shows uh, gadolinum-enhancing lesions, and he is JC virus serology positive. So... Uh, which therapy would you use in this situation? So this is now an extremely difficult situation, and um, there isn't a straightforward choice. Continuing therapy with natalizumab uh, is feasible, but the risks of PML are approaching uh, 1 in 90. Um, it would be good to at least look around for alternative therapies. The most effective of these would probably be autologous hematopoietic stem cell transplantation, but this has a mortality even in the best hands of 2 to 3%. Fingolimod is clearly a lot safer, um, and uh, as an oral therapy is on the face of it attractive, um, but is almost certainly less efficacious than natalizumab. And we have here someone whose MS is breaking through even natalizumab therapy. Alemtuzumab, which is a drug that is not available in the U.S. but is available in Europe, does offer uh, significant e efficacy, possibly uh, equivalent to natalizumab, um, but its safety profile after serial immunotherapies uh, is not clear. So case two is very tricky and represents, I think, the most difficult challenge in contemporary MS therapeutics. If we move on to case three, we have a 24-year-old man who has been fine on interferon beta for a few years, and an MRI scan shows two gadolinium-enhancing lesions. So which therapy would you use in this context? Well, uh, some physicians would recommend continuing on interferon beta or glutirima. Indeed, some physicians would not have organized an MRI scan of the brain in this context. Um, but I hope you can be persuaded by the arguments, for instance, that Rick Rudick has proposed in his presentations here at this uh, website, that we need to respond uh, by escalating therapy in the face of asymptomatic MRI new lesion formation. So we'd be looking here for a more efficacious treatment than interferon. Uh, I think fingolimod or natalizumab would be most common choices in this situation. Uh, and I've made the point that patients will have a, a superficial attraction to fingolimod, but it is a complex treatment, and potentially natalizumab might be preferable uh, for some individuals. Case four is a 18-year-old woman who has had three episodes of brainstem demyelination uh, within a year and has four enhancing lesions on an MRI scan of the brain. She's not received any previous therapy. What therapy would you now offer her? So this case, case fits the definition of rapidly evolving severe multiple sclerosis. Uh, this subgroup that's emerged out of the regulators and uh, which uh, we don't really use in clinical practice, but we would certainly recognize this as an aggressive case. In as much as we can say, the prognosis is for rapid accumulation of disabilities. So most people would consider it reasonable to consider first-line therapy with an aggressive, medium-risk, uh, medium-gain immunotherapy such as natalizumab, uh, fingolimod might be used here, uh, and likewise alemtuzumab, where available, might have a place here. And finally, um, case five, a 22-year-old woman with three episodes of demyelination within three years, 
and uh, just four plaques, no enhancing lesions, just four plaques on an MRI scan of the brain. Which therapy would you use here? So um, this is my parting shot. I'm sure most people will have um, gone for either uh, interferon beta or glutirima, uh, possibly dimethyl fumarate where available, very good options in the uh, low risk, low gain uh, category of drugs. Uh, but I've made this the last response because I want to make a final bid for induction therapy for exposing a patient like this to a powerful and effective drug early on in the treatment of multiple sclerosis to avoid the accumulation of further disability and betraying my prejudices as my experience I would opt for alemtuzumab in this situation. I'm well aware that many people listening to this webcast would consider uh, that an adventurous approach to the treatment of multiple sclerosis. But my final point would be to say, however we tackle multiple sclerosis, please do not let us be in the position as we have been for years of just watching the accumulation of disability in the patients in front of us. Let's work hard to prevent that. Thank you very much. Thanks, Dr. Coles, for a thorough, thoughtful, and elegant talk on what is often a messy, slipshod, and unintelligible alphabet soup of medications for MS. You've provided the framework for decision-making, which includes elements of safety, desirability, and efficacy in a simple but profound visual scheme. As time goes on, this scheme will likely change as we learn more about the side effects, long-term efficacy, and tolerability of our newer agents. Going forward, it will be increasingly important to have well-defined strategies to implement and utilize these many medicines we have. In addition, the days of large placebo-controlled trials in relapsing multiple sclerosis are probably numbered. It may be time for us to shift to comparison studies of, say, an escalation study versus an induction study in populations to try to extend and amplify the observations made in the more rigid pivotal trial paradigm. In addition, it is becoming clear that real-world testing of such strategies makes sense as issues of personalized risk analysis, comorbidities, tolerability, and predictions of disease severity may dramatically change the way these medicines are used. Such strategies can only be hinted at in traditional phase three trials and must be sought in the admittedly imperfect stadium of clinical practice. 